You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It's time for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by Russell Investments, home of Russell Indexes, which calculates approximately 700,000 benchmarks daily, covering 98% of the investable market globally, including more than 80 countries and more than 10,000 securities. Approximately $4.1 trillion in assets are benchmarked to the Russell Indexes. For more information on Russell Indexes and RVX, please visit russell.com slash indexes. And now it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name is Mark Longo from the Options Insider radio network as well as of course from the optionsinsider.com and that's probably the best place to go our old web portal there if you want to find all the great programs that we produce as well as of course all of our archived episodes of volatility views they are legion they are many over there right now dozens hundreds of hours of great volatility content awaits you just in this one program alone let alone our other dozen programs on the network so if you really want to sink your teeth into some volatility content, some great interviews, some great guests, some great debates, discussions, analysis, some great listener feedback, all sorts of fun stuff, then that's the place for you to go. Of course, you can also search for Volatility Views as in all the major stores, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, et cetera, et cetera. And if that's all too much work, you can't be bothered. Just go grab our mobile app. It's available in all the major app stores, except Windows Mobile. So if you're the two people out there who use Windows Mobile, we apologize. <laughs> but it's available in all the major app stores. Just slap it on your device of choice, and you can stream from the map, or you can even download it to the app. So if you're going on a plane or a train or an automobile or whatever you prefer, you can download it and listen to it at your leisure there. So no shortage of ways for you guys to get access to this fun, fun content. And, of course, while you're listening, we love to hear from you. So you have questions, you have comments, you have feedback. Let us know. No shortage of ways for you guys to do just that. And it's all baked in to the mobile app where you can find it on our website or just find us on social media. Just look for ad options on Twitter. Probably the easiest place to find us. All right. And joining me on the old Volatility Views program again, starting off. Well, I don't know if we're starting off in the order of proximity or not, because last week he was all the way in the heart of the South there in Oklahoma. Is he back in Chicago now or no? I don't know. We'll find out. He is Russell Rhodes, the senior instructor over there at the Options Institute at the CBOE. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to the Volatility Views program. And let's play a little Where's Russell this week. Where are you? Still out in the in the heartland there? Or are you back in, Chi in Chi-Town? I am. You, you like to call it the corner office, but I'm uh, back in my office at the CBOE today. This time next week, I'll be on a plane heading to Hong Kong for our first risk man management conference. Well, it's a good thing we're not doing a show on Black Friday then, so you have time yeah. to fly. And I don't call it your corner office. I call it the palatial estate. Should I, should I amend <laughs> that? It keeps growing a, every week. It's a gorgeous it's office. Not, it's it's neither. a really cool parking lot. <laughs> All the nice Bentleys that he overlooks from his palatial corner estate there at the SIBO. It's going to grow in size and scope every week, Russell, so just, just get ready for that. And that other voice you heard, slightly tinny, could be none other than the greasy meatball himself, Mr. Mark Sebastian, from Myriad Ventures these days, including OptionPit.com, where you can get some great options, education, and mentoring, and training, and of course, his newest venture over there, Carmen Line Capital. Mr. Greasy Meatball, welcome back to the old program, sir. 
Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to be here. Well, if you can see me, I'm doing something wrong because we're all video. But aside from mm-hmm. that, I'm glad you could join us here as well. A lot of volatility action to sink our teeth into this week. So without further ado, let's dive right into it and right on into our volatility review. It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the Volatility Review. All right, everybody, welcome to the Volatility Review. This is indeed the portion of the program where we break down the week that was. From a volatility trading and analysis perspective, we are recording this on Friday, November 20th, for all of you playing along at home there. Hard to believe November is just just hurtling by, but say la vie, we're coming up on a holiday weekend here in the state, so all sorts of fun stuff to get to. But first, let's get into what we're seeing so far. We are still mid-session today here on Friday, and as we're recording this, most of the major indices up fairly strongly, if not as robustly as we've seen in some recent sessions, up about half a percent, pretty much across the board on most of the major indices, and it seems like they collectively decided after yesterday, given a little bit of a bid to the term structure out there and volatility in VIX land, decided, oh, wait, there is a holiday weekend coming next week. Let's start taking that out because they're kind of just playing the old crushola today. VIX cash hovering 15.75 or so off about 1.25 points or cover yours, Mr. Sebastian, over 7%. It's a percent of percent heresy. Uh, but uh, aggressiveness as they decided, I guess we were joking about this on a recent episode of Option Blog, Andrew and I, kind of just the schizophrenic nature of the volatility trading crowd. They got to have it. They can't touch it. They got to have it. They don't want any t- anything to do with it. It seems like they're more schizophrenic out there in the vol space than in any other product we see. It's just, it's just that almost binomial nature, that binary nature of that audience. They hate it. They love it. And today, apparently... They're hating it, and they're hating it in force. So that said, uh, maybe we'll start with you, Mr. Palatial Estate. A lot of stuff popping off this week. What caught your eye in this week's volatility activity? Well, first off, I am shocked, I tell you, that we are under 16. I really felt like 16 may hold until the middle of December at least, you know, and, and I was well aware that we, you know, Thanksgiving's a Thursday this year, and I was well aware that we were going to have, you know, a, a, uh, a holiday week in there, but I still felt yeah, like we would hold joke. 16. Did, did you get that one? Okay. I did. Mark <laughs> so did. That, that's probably I'm, the, I'm the too one busy. thing that really I'm too busy actually running so the far. show over here, unfortunately. I got other things going on while you're talking. But, yes, good joke. I liked it. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, we, we are below 16 at the moment. And I guess if, if it were going to happen now is about when it would happen with the holiday next week. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the other thing that caught my eye was we actually had, you know, multiple block trades in the VIX weeklies that expire next Tuesday on the open. And they expire next Tuesday on the open because of uh, the Christmas holiday, which is on a Friday this year. Uh, on December 25th, we're going to have SPX options that expire on the 24th. So when you backtrack 30 days, you get a Tuesday AM settlement next week for um, next week's VIX weeklies. And there was a 1719 bear call spread, an 1820 bear call spread, and a big seller of the 16 puts as well. So uh, uh, using those options back on Tuesday of this week. So that was the other thing that kind of caught my eye was, and, and it looked like it was different players for all three trades. So increasing volume and, you know, more institutions seem to be coming into that space. Yeah, it looks like a lot of paper. I mean, we'll get to the the options paper in a little bit, but I'm just glancing at uh, some of the analytics while you were talking here. Yeah, about uh, 10,000 going up and just the no 16 and 19 weekly front week, front day essentially puts uh, over here. These That's 11,000, 12,000 contracts right there. Uh, so they are still lighting it up out there in the weeklies. But before we get to all of that fun stuff, Let's turn our attention to the greasy meatball. Mr. Sebastian, what caught your eye in the week that was from a volatility perspective? You know, um, you know I, I tend to agree with Russell that I, th- I think we're going to be firm through uh, the middle of December. Uh, what was really odd, uh, you know, we're recording this on a Friday, Thursday, which was the 19th. 
uh, really strange movement in the VIX futures relative to the cash. We were looking at a day where uh, the cash was basically unchanged, and we were seeing the December future, Jan future, and February all up 3 4%. Uh, just a really strange move on a day the S&P wasn't doing anything, uh, the cash wasn't doing anything. There were pretty strong buyers of futures across the board and the entire vol complex. Uh, another weird one was earlier in the week we saw a day where uh, on one of the sell-offs where it's kind of the market was uh, where front month, front month vol was getting bid and back month vol was uh, was actually getting sold a little bit, so they were actually flattening the curve. So just some odd b price behavior in the VIX futures in the last week, uh, as well as there is one client out there that is just a, and is one guy, one trader, has just a massive, voracious appetite for upside calls in VIX. And, uh, you know, that'll be a, I'm going to have some comments on that, but what I'll say is this is, this guy has been, has done this before, and the last time he was right. Oh, does someone like some VIX calls this week? I hadn't noticed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, all upside in bulk. Yeah, to say a few VIX calls went up this week uh, would be underselling it quite a bit. But we'll get to that in a moment. First, uh, looking back at the week that was, you know, I, I tend, and probably you guys are this way too, I, I tend to kind of tune out uh, the furor that seems to erupt around VIX settlement every time, just because, took me now with the weeklies, it's a more frequent occurrence, A, and then B, it just seems like no one's ever happy in that scenario. So I tend to turn it, tune it out. Thankfully, it doesn't seem to have been that loud of late, except for this week. It seems to have been, once again, a bit of a contentious one. It settled out earlier this week. Uh, over the 19 handle, 19.16, I believe, which as you can sell type today's activity is uh, a bit aggressive, a bit generous, uh, given we've seen pretty much nothing but downside from a vol perspective ever since then. And as you might expect, when that happens, people tend to be up in arms. I've seen a lot of different people uh, chiming in on this one. I even saw a piece over there. I think Adam over there at these at Schaefer's now uh, talking about how he went and dug into uh, what was going on. Of course, we see these allegations all the time of the quote unquote carpet bombing of lighting up essentially every, you know, out of the money put strike. And he says, essentially, I haven't had a chance to verify this myself, but he said literally every strike all the way down to the D100 put uh, was uh, active in some capacity, probably indicating that someone was trying to do something uh, ahead of the settlement. So uh, interesting stuff. I don't know. Like I said, I, I, kinda, I tend to, this, this noise kind of tends to wash over me now, uh, but it seems like this one may be a little bit more cacophonous than others of late. Russell, have you been paying attention to this at all? You think this is kind of just uh, a lot of much ado about nothing? I talked to him for a little while. <laughs> so beyond um, yesterday, so uh, beyond paying attention to it, I, uh, you know, I know I, I read what he said and, you know, I, I understand uh, sometimes that, that, you know, there's a little bit of a conspiracy thought around the, the SPX opening prints on Dick's settlement day. Uh, you know, we were, I think, maybe about 60 cents with settlement outside of the range. Uh, of the opening range of the day. So it wasn't, you know, we, we've seen them, um, you know, even even more outside of the opening range. And that's just because the way VIX settlement is calculated is a little bit different than the way spot VIX is calculated. We're only using one expiration series and we're using the opening trades. Um, but we also have a pretty extensive um, opening process around the SPX options on settlement day. And uh, opening orders have to be in earlier than they normally have to be in. And we actually solicit uh, liquidity providers to try to take the other side of as many orders as possible. So if you, and, and I've actually, you know, tried to figure out if I were going to do this, how would I go about trying to fiddle around with VIX settlement? And I think the cost associated with trying to do that would outweigh any benefit that you could possibly come up with. So I just don't think that, um, you know, I don't think 
whoever they are in the uh, you know the dark suits and the black helicopters or whatever are are having really in any influence on Vic settlement. It's just uh, a feature that you have with any AM settled derivative contract. Um, you're going to take opening prices from the S and P 500 for the old school SPX options. You're going to take opening prices for the S and P 500 options for VIX. And you know every once in a while, and and I'm going to use I'm going to paraphrase somebody that I was talking to about SPX this past week. Um, every once in a while, you get your rear end handed to you with overnight settlement. It's just it, it's just the nature of that type of settlement process. Uh, I don't. I mean, it was a little bit out of line, but it really wasn't that far out of line with um, you know price activity as of late. Yeah, we've said it many times on the show, and it's probably worth repeating. I think Adam even mentions it in his piece. That's one of the reasons why I saw it, too, just because he's not known to be in the histrionic camp uh, for the tinfoil no, hatters no. out there. And, so. and one other thing I want to say about um, Adam's piece, and, and, and I, I always like whenever, regardless of what the circumstances are, uh, somebody highlights the risks associated with AM settlement. Yep. Um, I, I never talk about VIX without bringing that up. Because when, um, if somebody has an, an unfortunate, uh, you know, they don't know VIX is AM settled, you know, and the, and they get a, an, you know, an unhappy surprise. Needless to say, if they get a happy surprise, I don't hear about it. But I will hear about unhappy surprises, and I don't like having those conversations. You don't want the call that, hey, I won, uh, I won my two million in the lottery today. You don't get those yeah, calls, nobody, Russell. Nobody calls to tell you that, <laughs> but boy, does yeah. the call tell you the, the other side of it. Like I was saying before, we said it before on the show, but it's worth repeating. You know, if you if you don't want to be subject to this, and it is very much still, you know, uh, a, shall we say a, a chaotic process, just for all the things that go on out there, then just close out going into it. You don't need to subject yourself to this if you don't want it to. If you if you go into this process, go in with your eyes open fully aware that you may not like the outcome. Well, you may like it. You never know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, these, these, you know, at this point, we kind of know, you know what you're getting out there in Vixland. So when these things, they shouldn't come as any sort of surprise. We, we've been talking about them going back to the earliest days of the show, which is going on about four years now, if not longer. And it goes well beyond that, obviously. So this is not exactly a new phenomenon. Mr. Sebastian, did you take particular umbrage this week to the settlement, or were you pretty much in line with it? it it's been a crazy few weeks so i was i was unsurprised that settlement was a little little screw i was surprised they went all that things traded all the way down to the 100 strike that's unique um and uh but you know you get what you get when you trade into settlement you're you're asking for it uh, i agree with you mark uh, anytime you're going to trade settle or you're going to play around with that stuff just just close it out all right that you're not, you know, unless unless somebody's giving you something for free, just just close it, take the money, run, leave. Yeah, at this know? point, it's it's fully a choice to go through that process or not. You can roll, you can do a lot of things. You don't need to sit there and subject yourself to that if you don't want to. So if you do, then you know, uh, I hate to say that you've made your bed, but you kind of have. And so you got to deal with the consequences as a result. Looking back at the uh, broader volatility landscape, things were not as volatile this week as they have been in recent weeks. Our old friend VIX, which of course measures the vol of vol, the volatility of VIX out there, if you will, coming off a wee bit. We were trading, or it was trading. It was, it was quoting, disseminating out there last week in the mid-90, 96 or so range, coming down a little bit this week hovering at about the uh, 91 range, which is kind of right in the middle of where it's kind of been vacillating. It's kind of been bounding on the lower end in the uh, mid-80s or so in the upper bound, recent upper bound, right around the 105, 108 range or so. Of course, uh, go back into August, and it got off the charts into the 200 level. But we won't we won't speak of those aberrant days uh, because that was kind of a bit of a, uh, shall we say, an outlier uh, for uh, to, to put it mildly, and of course we still have the Fed on the horizon, uh, wagging their finger, saying they're going to do something out there in December, and that seemed to at least earlier this week kind of cause uh, some of that funky term structure you were alluding to it earlier, Mark, kind of uh, playing out in some weird ways out there in Vixland in the futures this week uh, with a lot of firmness, and then it seems obviously aggressively coming off now as the, collectively the volatility community saying, you know what, we don't really need. <laughs> we don't really need all this vol that we really needed yesterday. Uh, always, always love how that works out. And, of course, uh, looking back at our old friend, the skew, see how it's shaping up 
out there in S&P land. We are, again, pushing towards uh, those highs out there again. So it's firm, but nowhere near as firm as it has been, about about a 139 out there, which is off the 150 or so level, 152, I believe it hit a few weeks back, which was showing, uh, you know, we've talked about skew index many times, the pros and cons of it. Uh, so we take it with a bit of a grain of salt, but that said, it is showing fairly firm out there. If you are so inclined to purchase some protection, be forewarned out there in the S&P. And we alluded to it a bunch. Let's just get into it with the paper we saw out there in VIX options land. It was a bit of a, uh, I guess you can call it a, a bifurcated week. It was really heavy early on in the week with a lot of paper really lighting it up. Uh, we saw a million contracts going up on Monday, 800,000 on Tuesday. Not surprised going into the settlement process. Those days would be pretty heavy. Uh, and then coming out of that, it really kind of just fell off a cliff, light volume of the rest of the week. As we're looking at it right now, stands here about middle of the session or so on Friday, about 166,000 contracts haven't gone up. So clearly today, probably going to be another one of those lighter days. Wait, well off the ADV of about 720,000 contracts that has been going up of late. And Mark alluded to it earlier. We touched on it a little bit on the option block uh, this week as well. But there were, if there was a narrative out there in VIX land this week, it was a decent upside pretty much all the time. Get it when you can get it and get it in size. We saw people, people buying pretty much most of the decent upside strikes, particular attention and it seems like the D's 27 through the 30 strike were lighting it up. I saw some people adding it up earlier this week, about half a million contracts or more going up collectively in those strikes this week. The lion's share of that actually buying and the size one that really caught our attention yesterday on the option block and Mark I think is the one you've been kind of digging into as well uh, was the D's 27s going up in multiple chunks uh, for 50 cents and prices around that range, paper buying a uh, total of 100,000 or just about 100,000 going up yesterday. So that was clearly the size print for yesterday and probably the size print of the week. And I know, Mark, you guys were digging into a little bit about what was going on behind the scenes with that trade. As we always know, whenever things go up in the listed, particularly for that kind of size, there tends to be something else OTC lurking on the other side of it. So what did your investigations uncover on this trade? Well, we didn't find any over-the-counter trades. I reached out to a few people, and there wasn't anything there. Um, what we do know is this is the same guy that, that put up this big trade, uh, a similar set of big trades in August, and won pretty handily. So, um, you know, we were kind of theorizing one of the two things. One, uh, you know, it's a terrorist Federal Reserve VIX going higher. Two, the guy made so much money on his last trade uh, set of these trades that he's, you know, thinks that, you know, now is as good a time ever for VIX to really pop, which I think a lot of people would agree with. Uh, it, why not spend a, a pittance of the money that he made in August to uh, take another serious crack at, at the market popping. And a lot of people think that histor that historically, oh, seasonality, December, super great. You know, yes, uh, not the last few years. And, you know, the, the last couple weeks of December tends to be nice, but the first couple weeks can, uh, can be – have some fireworks, folks. So uh, especially coming out of a Thanksgiving holiday when people get a little maybe overzealous selling premium – so that that's my best bet on what this guy was doing. Um, but I know all that upside call buying, the, you know, the 300,000 plus uh, calls was 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 one customer. It's crazy. I guess he got some money to burn from from August. He decides he could, he could burn a little bit of it. If it doesn't work out, say la vie. And this is just to clarify, this is a different guy than our one by two friend out there. right? This is not the one by two guy. This is a different guy. Because if it was him, I'd say he's changed religions. He's going straight up upside this time. No, no, no. This is this is the other guy that was buying all the upside calls in, in August. Uh, he won on a bunch of September calls. Yeah, having an upside in that time frame, you're probably sitting pretty on your own private island right about now. You got some money to burn on 100,000 or so Disa calls here in VIX. Mr. Russell, have you had a chance to check out any of this paper? 
And in addition to this, uh, all this size upside, I know we're talking about the weeklies too. So what, what paper really caught your eye out there in the options land this week? Well, that seller of the 16 puts in the next week, uh, you know, I guess one of the reasons that I found that interesting was just it, it kind of agrees. It, it, it agrees with me, which is I, I felt like 16 was going to be kind of a floor. You know, I will see if uh, if we rebound or not, if or if they uh, feel a little pain for that. They took in like um, – Gosh, I want to actually actually about nine thousand more of those have traded today while we're talking, um, and I'm not I can't tell from my screen if they're buying or selling them, but uh, you know maybe they're doubling down on their position here. Uh, they're actually uh, you know they're twenty cents by thirty five cents right now, uh, so that's the one you know the one that really caught my eye. The you know everybody was looking at the upside. Uh, Dees 27 calls. Uh, you know, I wonder if uh, I was looking at the 27s and maybe selling the 29s. You could do something like that for 15 cents right now, uh, mm-hmm. looking out to December. That's not something somebody's doing, but if you really think that, uh, you know, the, the, the next volatility event, which is the polite way of saying big market sell off, uh, is going to occur between now and the middle of December, there's some really cheap ways to play it right now. Yeah, I mean, Russell, this guy has gone down the line in terms of stuff he's bought. Oh, yeah. He bought the 30s, he bought the 29s, skipped the 28s for some reason, then bought the 27s. (gasps) You know what? 28 is an – 8s are an unlucky number in certain cultures. Is that right? So is that an unlucky number in France? I don't know where it is, but uh, eight is an unlucky number in some places. Maybe that that can help us narrow down who this is, at least by a continent. Well, I know what bank he clears, but that's that's about all I know about this guy. Maybe is this part of your research for your upcoming Hong Kong uh, speech? You're learning which uh, which dates and numbers are unlucky what's to a, that audience. Yeah, I'm, what's a or what's a bad number? And and I actually eight is lucky in China. In fact, a disproportionate number of IPOs in China have eight is the last digit. Yeah, Russell, so I'll tell you, the, isn't it ridiculous? This, so. this guy had built. Uh, had had screwed around with volatility so much that there was a period of time yesterday where uh, the D, the December twenty seven calls had a higher volatility than the twenty eights, and uh-huh. you could actually buy that call spread for a vol credit. Really? Yeah. Wow. The I know is, it's close to that right now when I'm fiddling around with the quotes. Or excuse me, you could sell it at a vol credit, which is really rare. I know. Yeah. And those yeah. those two are right on top of each other. Yeah. The the twenty. The 28s continue to be the cheapest option on the board, by far. They, uh, you know, maybe they think he's going to come in and that's the one he's going to sell if we get a spike. Who knows? He bought, he he finished up on the open. They traded 5,000 of the, these 27s for 48 cents. Guy probably could have done better if he waited a little bit. uh, I would have sold those if I could have. Well, if, if he's in another part of the world, he had to go to bed. Uh, That's true. Entirely yeah. possible. There's no sleeping yeah. when you're working half a million of uh, Vic's upside. There, you just you're up exactly. Well, so he's only to be fair. It's only three hundred thousand. That's true. He's not all okay. of that. He's a, he's a lion's share, but he's not all of that. Seems like you know we we love these disturbances out there in the Vic's forest because they do line up so many other great uh, trading opportunities. But we're always saying on our network, regardless of if it's Apple or Facebook or whatever, don't be the guy coming in buying the three hundred and first thousand first contract here on the 27s maybe you use it to leg in some other spreads it seems like you're not the only one who had that idea russell i was just parsing some of the other interesting trades going up this week out there in vix land and uh, obviously they're a little bit smaller than the ones we were just talking about so you're finding a little bit of a needle in a haystack but there were some interesting ones that 27 strike clearly a popular one looks like we saw someone Coming up with a little bit of a four-way, 15,000 times. Looked like the Nove 1927 uh, call spread paper was uh, buying that. Looks like probably to close that out. So they're buying 19, selling the 27s, then reestablishing out there, selling in January. They're selling the Jan 19s and then buying your 27. So he is kind of piling on to that buying fest out there on the 27 strike. Uh, Doing it about 15,000 times, so about... 60,000 net contracts total. So again, fairly sizable trade uh, when you add it all up. And a few other, it looks like some funky uh, multi-leg uh, trades going up. It's like a 6,800 contract trade of the, uh, it's like the D17 straddle versus the 22 calls in D. And then it looks like the selling the 40 calls out there in March. So some interesting, funky four ways going up out there, but obviously a lot smaller size uh, than what we saw in the mammoth just gobbling up 
of all things DC upside. Let us know if you agree with that paper, listeners. Are you guys uh, are you bullish on VIX right now as well as bullish as our friend out there? Are you maybe leaning into some verticals yourself, or are you are you more on the other side of the tip? You think we have some more downside to go? In which case, maybe you want to load up on some of those sixteen puts that uh, Russell was talking about earlier. We love to hear from you guys your sentiments, of course, as we dive on into what people are actually trading out there. The big hot uh, big ticket items out there in VIX land, the hot strikes. And once again, the DC 20s top in the list, 310,000 contracts on that strike, leading the charge. Then we dropped down quite a bit, 261,000 contracts for the number two spot, the Jan 30s, uh, the ever optimistic Jan 30s. Uh, and then, of course, number three, 237,000 of the DC 29s, followed by the DC 30s, also optimistic, 233,000 of those open. Then we dropped below 200,000, 199 to be precise, for the number five spot, the Jan 22s, number six, D25s, 183,000 contracts. Number seven, 158,000, falling off again to the D35s, even more optimistic. Then we got to go all the way down to number eight and number nine to find any puts on the list, but at least there are some puts lighting it up this week to the tune of the D's 15 and 14 puts, 155 and 142,000 times, respectively, and, and rounding it out, yet another put. So three puts on the top 10. It's been a while since we've seen anything like that. 139,000 of the DS 16 puts total. Again, we're just coming off of uh, the settlement this week. So you're going to see OI a little bit lighter. Anyway, about 5.2 million contracts open. About 3.7 on the calls, 1.4 on the puts. And this is usually where we'll turn our attention to earnings volatility, but there really hasn't been uh, a heck of a lot of it really left to watch. We're kind of on the the dregs of the earnings season. Unless, of course, Sebastian, I know you love your your preteen clothing retailers, and we did have uh, Abercrombie coming out this morning. So that one, I'm sure, excited you. Well, of course, you know, because, uh, you know, it's ever since LFA, LFO came out with new uh, their I Like Girls Who Wear Abercrombie and Fitch, Girls in the Summer song, I've uh, I've been uh, in love with Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, you know, I like walking by there on Fifth Avenue with the, when they've got those shirtless guys standing out front. Can't beat it. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, Gap, uh, Best Buy, a bunch of retailers came out. Uh, it's been interesting watching the retailers. They uh, After Macy's, a lot of the Macy's brands got kind of smoked. So, uh, but, we, but we're nearing the end of earnings season, and it ended up not being that bad. Companies did a really good job of sandbagging their earnings so that uh, a lot of them met or, or bet. Uh, I think the other piece of interesting news has been uh, Square, where the IPO guys guess somehow got them to, to go from 11 to 13 to nine bucks, and then immediately printed it back up to 13 dollars. Uh, quite possibly one of the the better things I've seen. Yeah, that was pretty funny. You know, you got to love these things. Yeah, they get them all the way down. <laughs> we'll buy it at nine, and then we'll just we'll just support it, drive it all the way up to what was yeah, it about, about I was, 13. I was, jo- I was joking that they should uh, re- change their symbol from SQ to FIST. You know, that whole underwriting IPO process has been the biggest scam on the planet for so long. And these, these firms yeah. are starting to feel that now. And uh, maybe they'll see some pushback. I wish more firms would kind of go the old Google route of the Dutch auction. It, it seemed to work out pretty well for them. And there's actually some legitimate order intent behind that process versus whatever vague whims the underwriter has for your and whatever agenda they have for your IPO product. Yet still a lot of these firms go that route. I don't, I'm scratching my head as to why maybe the square debacle. Uh, we'll wake them up. And I, I hate to burst your bubble, Mr. Sebastian, but I'm not sure if you heard in Abercrombie land, they are moving away from the shirtless teen model. So they're going after an older, more affluent clientele, I think in their mid to late 20s and 30s even. So uh, no more uh, shirtless preteens running around the mall for you. I'm sorry. All right, Al, what are you going to do? <laughs> Mr. Russell, I know uh, you're, you've been watching a lot of earnings of late. We're kind of winding down at the end of the season. Any names this week really catching your eye from an earnings volatility perspective? Uh, nothing really caught my eye, you know, that that, that we haven't just mentioned. Uh, one stock that's always a lot of fun that's actually reporting next Monday is GameStop. So by the time this is out there, uh, people will be taking a look at uh, GME. But if this week was was retail week, which it was, uh, next week is kind of like food week, which I guess is appropriate for Thanksgiving because you've got Tyson's, Campbell's Soup, and you know, deer, which does the, uh, the, the farming for those sorts of things, uh, reporting. And you know what? We're not talking about very volatile names reporting in what's really not a volatile week normally. 
And I, I always admired GameStop because in this era of uh, the decline of the options market makers, they've created their own market making operation. They've been printing money for a long time. Different, different underlying used games, but they're essentially they're the dream of the old market maker. Where you could be the only guy in the pit and make your markets as wide as you want. And that's what they've done now in that used game business and made quite a business out of it. Uh, buying and selling their bid offer spread quite wide over there, milking all these kids for their games. So, uh, yeah, they've done pretty well for themselves. Of course, that market probably dwindling in the near future as we have all sorts of electronic distribution on the doorstep here. But still, got to gotta salute someone for finding a market and just ruthlessly exploiting it to the ultimate maximum. Turning our attention to the shiny stuff in the land of commodities, of course, gold had uh, an interesting week as well, rallying a wee bit yesterday before giving up some of it again today, off about half a percent or so or close to it out there in the shiny stuff land. And all this vacillation has caused, and you were talking before, it wasn't too long ago, we were talking about how calls were the order of the day out there in the big gold futures options, and people were recommending one by twos and one by threes, and just to get that upside short as much as you could out there because it was so rich. We've seen a bit of a flip of that script this week and in recent weeks where the puts are starting to uh, dominate the conversation again, probably reflecting some more of these concerns we're seeing about protracted downside here in gold. It is interesting how sh- quickly the narrative does shift out there, bullish, bearish, bearish, bullish, not as rapidly as the vol space where it's every day there's a different narrative at work, but still it is pretty interesting to watch. And our gold VIX, good old GVZ, coming off a wee bit today, but at about 17 half or so, a wee bit lighter than it was last week. And, of course, out there in the other side of the space, I should mention, too, out there in GLD, which is a gold product a lot of you guys like to trade, things are still pretty heavy out there. Options open interest at the most robust level it's been all year, and uh, call open interest still fairly strong, uh, about uh, oh, about 98th percentile out there versus uh, the puts, only 93rd. So uh, the puts starting to catch up, and they, certainly this past week have been bidding it up, but in general, still the net open interest love still leaning very call heavy overall. Turn into the crude. We talked on recent shows about how the big futures options were pricing in a pretty decent premium to the puts all the way out until the end of 2016. And that narrative hasn't really shifted too much. We're still seeing uh, a premium to the puts out there. It's a little bit come off a little bit, obviously, because gold, excuse me, crude has sold off since we started talking about this about a week and a half ago. Uh, so we're seeing some of that premium come in, as of course you expect to with the skew, and a little bit of a bid coming up to those calls. But still, it is puts uh, leading the charge out there. We're seeing the vol land out there in terms of the various vixes out there hovering in the mid 43 range or so 43 half or so around that range so slightly elevated when compared to last week but nothing uh, nothing extreme not in the high 50s or 60s as we've seen recently out there as well maybe mr sebastian we'll start with you anything catching your eyes either in the shiny stuff or the black texas tea stuff or maybe some other commodities catching your eye from a vol perspective well you know we can see we continue to see oil vol get bid and gold vol kind of underperform for how ugly it's been for gold. Uh, there's been very little bid in GVZ, which is a little surprising. Uh, it continues to be uh, it continues to be kind of confusing that GVZ staying below twenty with gold just getting slapped around. Uh, bond vol continues to be interesting to me, but uh, oil vol there's definitely still bidding that one up. That's still in the forties. You know, GVZ is always an interesting one. Russ, I don't think I've ever had a chance to really get your your take on that one. That's always been kind of a mystery to us here uh, on the program. I remember having a heated argument with, uh, with the Rock Lops, I think, believe in Jared on the show not that long ago, where they were both arguing that that uh, product actually existed around it. I said, yes, it does. It doesn't trade, but it does exist. Uh, it's, it's one of those ones that always kind of made me scratch my head because it seems like on the surface, two great tastes that taste great together, gold and VIX, two products that are very hot in the mind of retail and institutional, yet for whatever reason, uh, the underlying product never took off. I'm curious if, if, you know, if you've been watching that one. Obviously, the GBZ is still widely followed. Uh, so you, um, I'm curious, A, your thoughts on just GBZ in general, and then B, the landscape now, how it's shaping up for commodity vol across the board. The thing with the gold volatility is it, it 
it, it didn't have the, the definable price relationship that you have between VIX and the S&P 500. So, you know, you get a sell-off in gold and you, you get a spike in gold volatility. You get a rally in gold and you get, get a spike in gold volatility sometimes. And, the, you know, that, that kind of, uh, I think it scared some of the casual potential users of GVZ off. Uh, so I, I think that's that's why the, the tradable product didn't work out quite the way that that you would have hoped. Uh, one of the things that I like about both GVZ and and OVX, I think they do a fairly decent job of giving you an idea of of you know which market may have the next big move. And even though oil has been in somewhat of a range, you know, as, as Mark Sebastian mentioned a, few, a couple of minutes ago, you know, we, you know, we've seen oil volatility continue to get bid. I mean, OBX is up today and oil is up slightly today, which, you know, when I see something like that, I think that, you know, I don't think that it's, it's buyers of call options on oil. I think it's, it's uh, people that have been wanting to be short oil, feeling like they may have missed it, and using today as an opportunity to get, or to at least try to get a little bit uh, of short oil um, positioning on. Yeah, it has been fun to watch. We could have, I've joked many times, but we could have easily done over this past year an entire gold volatility show. There's been that much going on out there. Of course, the big sell-off from over the 100 handle all the way down to the 40-odd handle range and the various permutations in between and the flip-flops and the skew and everyone getting long right around the 60 to 70 handle and getting completely blown out as it continued to the downside. And now this vacillation here, there's been enough to go there just to sink our teeth into quite a bit. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have on this episode, because I want to make sure you guys get some time on the program as well. So without further ado, let's dive right on into our volatility voicemail. It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL, posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, right. or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right, everybody, welcome to the volatility voicemail. Like the man said, this is the portion where you guys get to uh, join us and uh, make your questions and comments known to us. And Russell, you're officially a part of the show now because you're getting your own, uh, you're getting your own, <laughs> you're getting your own questions and comments. Uh, we asked for some, some voice, some, excuse me, some, some nicknames for you. And the, the first one, the first official suggestion coming in, may I remind you, I am the ultimate arbiter of all nicknames. So uh, they all have to go through me at the end of the day. But this is a good, a good starting point, perhaps. This comes from Hawkeye. He's been listening to the shows and writing in for a long time. I believe he's been some of our live events as well. So a long time listener here. I say, hey, Mark. Love seeing Russell as the new addition to the Volvo's cast of characters. You mentioned you wanted a nickname for him. Since he's going for his PhD, put in parentheses, but hasn't quite gotten it yet. This guy's pretty well versed. He is up on the shows. Uh, he teaches classes for the OIC. He meant, he meant Options Institute, but we'll give him that one. And he literally wrote the book on Vix. How about calling him Professor Vix and maybe moving to Dr. Vix once he gets his diploma? <laughs> Oh, your way to get to Dr. Vic. I love yeah, Adjunct that. Professor Vix. Adjunct that? Professor yeah, Vix. So. I both like it, but it's also far too flattering, sir. We, our nicknames, as the Greasy Meatballs evidence, uh, have to be a little bit more biting than that. But it's a good start. Uh, I also wanted to say that it was great hearing Don Palms out Schlesinger on the couple of shows back. You need to get him on as a guest more often. And we'll see. We're going to try to do just that. So don't worry there, Mr. Viceroy, or excuse me, Mr. Hawkeye. And see if the Viceroy can guest host once in a while, too. He's actually landed at a new. Uh, a new spot not sure if it's really if it really works out with the volatility uh type regime but it's kind of interesting uh, to see what he's up to maybe we'll get him on the network again one of these days he certainly did embrace uh, being the viceroy he loved it and lastly i love hearing from those typhon guys anytime you can get them on please do so anybody with the comedic sense to name their trades mullet and tell them is good in my book with wisdom wit and wisdom is the best mix thanks and keep the great shows coming hawkeye so First off, Russell, what's your take on that uh, that potential nickname? Uh, I'm I'm okay with that. I think uh, 
I, I, I visualize when I hear Dr. Vix, I think about the uh, Dan Aykroyd movie, Dr. Detroit. And I think I'm going to have to get myself all pimped out if I, uh, if I end up using doctor in my name. Wow, that's a, that's a weird. I didn't expect you to go there. I haven't seen that movie. So. A, bit of an obscure it's, it's reference. It's an old one. So. <laughs> bit of an obscure reference. Uh, and, of, of course, we love the feedback. Thank you. We do love those guests. We'll try to get them back on more. And, uh, Mark, a bit of love for your Typhon buddies over there as well. Yeah, they're, they're good peeps. I uh, was sitting, they were sitting right next to me here a little bit ago. Well, there you go. Tell them they got some love on the show. And I have to agree. I have to concur with that listener. I do love the, the mullet trades, the, <laughs> the business in the front party in the back type trades. Uh, that, that's definitely worth an appearance or two just for that. All right, let's move on to some of our other uh, feedback we got here on the show. Uh, we got a couple of related questions. Let's lump them together. Uh, the first one comes from Tiffany Tiffany L1. She writes, hey, is it possible to simply buy Bix Cash without messing with the futures? And then number two is from George T. He writes, can I buy, still buy VIX on the old calculation without the skew? So there's a lot to sink our teeth into. The first one, uh, if you've been listening to any of our shows of late, uh, Tiffany, you know we've been talking about uh, an interesting, if somewhat flawed, attempt to do just that, which is, of course, uh, the VIX up, VIX down product. It's had, it's, it's tries to do what you're talking about uh, without the futures, putting in a securities account with all the, we talked about the rebates and distributions. It's an extremely complicated and, and some may say uh, poorly performing, poorly tracking type product in an attempt to delivering what it's attempting to do. But that's what they're trying to do. I think the complexity of it will show you just how difficult and perhaps inherently undeliverable that concept is. And the second one, we had these guys on the show about a year ago. It was, uh, they're trying to do exactly that. Uh, the old calculation that they're trying to do that Valdex prog, which is essentially old VIX. It's VIX without the skew, uh, which I think is interesting in and of itself. I've never really been, uh, I'm, I, don't, I don't really understand all the proponents out there who want to strip the skew out of the new VIX calculation. I thought that was one of the best things they did when they revamped it, adding, I mean, we talked about the puts at the beginning of the show in terms of settlement. Yeah, they have some impact there that can maybe be contentious. But aside from that, I think volatility is more of a holistic picture than just front month at the money. There's things going on in the skew, obviously. And I think the calculation should reflect that. So I've always been a big fan of having uh, the actual skew in there, but still, there are some out there. Of course, that product doesn't exist yet. It's still just essentially a vaporware from a product perspective. They haven't launched. I think their their hangup has been launching a future or an ETF first. Then they want to list the options, and they haven't really had a chance to get either of them going. Uh, maybe, Russell, we'll start with you because you haven't really had a chance to pontificate on either of these yet. Uh, there's a lot to sink your teeth into here, either the, the craziness that is VIX up, VIX down, or even the notion. Uh, are you a fan of, tr- of the old calculation, trading VIX without the skew or do you like it better now are you a pro skew guy um well i'm a, I'm a pro skew guy because that's what we do here but um i have always liked the old calculation because you know you can you've only got a handful of options and that you're using for the calculation the problem is if you're going to trade a derivative on something like that and i'll go back to an earlier conversation that we had today um, you know, you're, you're worried about settling something or trading something that has a strip of 100 plus options. Uh, you've got to worry a little bit about the ability um, of um, an eight option derivative uh, or anything that only has eight underlying components uh, being traded. So that, you know, that's the thought on that. And then the, the VIX up and the VIX down, uh, you know, it's unfortunate that that didn't work as well as they had hoped that it would. Uh, you know, it, it, in the, the reset, uh, you know, I tried to track the performance of it in the blogs that we do here, and I just, it became too difficult just to figure out what the performance was, uh, let alone, you know, the price changes that go along with the, um, you know, with, with the way they keep resetting it. The closest thing you can get to VIX that, that trades fairly well right now is the uh, the front date of VIX future. As far yeah. as the weeklies go, uh, it's it's practically trading right on top of VIX. I've been tracking it intraday since we launched those back in July. And those things, um, you know, that that's as close as anybody's gotten so far to something that actually trades. Unfortunately, her one caveat, Tiffany, here was that she doesn't want to mess with the futures. <laughs> so well, that, that uh, puts that out of reach for her. They all want everything. Yeah, I know. Well, that's, you that's, know, I, Russell, they'll eventually come up with a weekly ETN 
off of the VIX futures that that maybe she can use if she doesn't want to use uh, ETFs. You know what I was just thinking about, you know, per our discussion of Valdex and things like that. Back in the day, I want to say when I was just kind of starting to really blog, uh, in 2011, I wrote a blog where I kind of looked at using skew index and uh, the VXO together to actually calculate a volatility on, you know, on out of the money puts as, as kind of its own index. And I called it the, uh, I, I, what did I call it? The SIBO option pit curve volatility index, even though CBO, CBOE wasn't an official signer since I was using uh, SIBO data. But, but it, you know, it was kind of an interesting piece. All I was doing was taking VXO times, you know, times uh, the the skew. If they actually, you know, one of the, one for skew index and Russell, this is what, something I pitched the the research team. Uh, I'd love to see them use like a five mi- a rolling five minute VWAP to make uh, the skew index actually have uh, actually tickable as opposed to end of day. And then if you did that versus uh, you know at the money volatility or whatever, you could actually get a real uh, a real view of what volatility is on out of the money puts, which I think is a lot more tangible than looking at a percentage of a percent. Um, you know, you're actually looking at, at kind of w- that, the mean volatility of those far out of the money options as a way of really gauging how expensive is stuff way out there. Well, I'm all over a real time, uh, skew index. That would be fantastic. I mean, that's something we've been talking about for I believe they are working on something like that. (laughs) They They don't don't include. Well, they don't include me in the conversations because I I never remember what I'm not supposed to talk about or talk about. You might come on a show like this and blab it all out. Right. I you know I'm I almost blurted out the big thing that's coming. Never mind. Go ahead. (laughs) Ah. You're getting the hang of this radio thing, the teases. I like it. Uh, but, Mark, I think you had much more success for that, uh, that put dissemination if you just tweaked it. Maybe the juicy put uh, indicator, something like that, rather than yeah, that or much the, longer, yeah, the, the <laughs> more confusing. Called the unit indicator, except if I don't, I don't know if I want to name something the unit indicator because I may get the wrong type of, of, of Google searches. You'd get some traction. I'm not sure if it's what you want, but you'd get, right. you'd get some hits. Good SEO on that, I would think. All right, great questions, everybody. We got a lot more, unfortunately. We've got to keep rolling. Keep them coming. We read them all. We try to squeeze them into every show whenever we can. And if we don't have a chance to read them on the show, we'll still write back to you. So we'll, you'll get your answer. And we love to feature some of the fun ones here on the old program. And now it's time for that ever-frustrating segment of the show. Yes, it's time for the Crystal Ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the crystal ball. All right, everybody, welcome to the crystal ball. As the name implies, this is the portion of the show where we gaze ever lovingly into the future, attempting to divine what those ever capricious vol gods hold in store for us for the week to come. This time last week, we were hovering around in the VIX cash land, about an 18 in the 18 handle range. It had briefly uh, gapped up to about the 20, over the 20 handle, very briefly, and then it was hovering in that range. And we were all kind of trying to figure out how all of this Fed premium and some of the earnings premium would kind of settle out. It seemed like none of us were really predicting too dramatic of a move uh, to the upside or the downside. And I think, as Russell said, most of us thought if there was downside to be had, it would be kind of stopped out at the 16 handle in the VIX cash, as we can see from today and from the the hammering that that vol took, they did break through that. As we're recording it now, listeners, as the show's coming to a close, they're flirting, getting closer to that 16 handle. So maybe we'll get back above it by the time the show is done. But still, a lot of us thought that would be kind of the floor, and clearly that was not the case. So maybe the sky is the limit to the upside or to the downside. If 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 you're buying all this paper we're seeing out in VIX options this week, then the upside is where the action is. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of grist for the mill this week. Maybe Mr. Greasy Meatball will start with you this time. Where does your crystal ball indicate for the week to come? Well, I mean, we are going to the Thanksgiving holiday, although uh, I want to say what it was a, a few years back. We had that big Dubai crisis and, you know, Vic shot up. So uh, anything can happen in the blink of an eye. So I uh, I generally lean toward volatility falling or, you know, VIX probably meandering toward 15 as they kind of force the the extra holiday timeout 
and then moving, you know, what we might see is this holiday effect where VIX gets down to 15, but then we come in on Monday after Thanksgiving and VIX is trading more like 16, 16 and a quarter. So we may get to a 15 VIX, even though it's, it's quote unquote, not a real 15. It's one of those holiday weekend 15s. Mr. Russell, how do you fall on this, sir? I love the not a real 15. I like that an awful lot. Um, if it's on a Friday know, in a holiday weekend, it's not real. I understand it, it but we, we, we don't seasonally adjust. So I know maybe, maybe we should consider that. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I actually expect us to close above 16 today. Um, I, I think maybe the little bit nervousness uh, and, and right, as we mentioned at the beginning, it's the middle of Friday as we speak. And VIX was about 1575 when we started. But um, I, you know, if, if I'm not even gazing out to the next week, I, I'm thinking that we actually uh, we get back to driving age in most states before the day's over with. And we stay above that level for for most of the rest of this year. I think they heard us. All the live listeners out there, whoever they may be, heard us talking up uh, all this VIX upside call action, and we talked up VIX single-handedly throughout the, throughout the course of the show. Yeah, but if, if I had to lean some way, and I, I kind of I, I lean more on the, on the former rather than the latter, I have a hard time, despite all the paper we saw this week, being a, a strong a believer in VIX going into any protracted holiday weekend. I think they're going to do kind of exactly what Mark was saying. They're going to squeeze it out uh, going into the weekend, and then they'll be their old schizophrenic self and realize, wait a minute— we overdid it, and it'll probably revert or pop back up a handle or so on the Monday following the holiday. So I, I could easily see it following a similar path of somewhere in that 15 range, and then all said and done back on the Monday after the holiday, because we won't be recording on Friday next week, by the way, listeners. It will be a, it'll be a Black Friday here in the States, so no, no volatility viewing for us, unfortunately, and for you, but we'll be back the week after. So uh, who knows? By the time we gather together in about two weeks, actually, we could be right about... Uh, this level again of course we'll have fed on the horizon then as well so that'll that'll throw a bit of a wild card into it i don't see i don't see 500,000 or so contracts this week notwithstanding any huge bids materializing in vix over the coming week we'll see what china and the fed have to say about that though and that music means it's, that's the end of this here Volatility Views program listener we love bringing it to you every week but before we go as always let me check back in with my cohorts here on the old volatility views panel. See what they have cooking up. Uh, Mr. Russell, we'll start with you. A little birdie's telling me, I think that was you actually, <laughs> that you could be on a plane this time next week. Where are you heading? I am heading to Hong Kong for our the first uh, Asian version of CBOE's risk management conference. And then I am going to, uh, I'll be there for two days, and then I go to Singapore for 10 days. And we will be opening the Options Institute at the Singapore Exchange in early December. So that's the two things I got going on. I do plan on uh, giving, giving an update on everything I learned at risk management when we get together in a couple of weeks. Woo! <laughs> I'm yeah. looking forward to that. And I was just talking to the Singapore guys over there at the FIA Expo, and they're clearly gung-ho for some options, education, and content over there. So I'm glad to see that you guys are expanding the reach. Who knows? Maybe you'll have a nice palatial corner office over there at the Singapore Options Institute as well, in which case I look forward to hearing all about it in a couple of weeks on the program. And Mr. Greasy Meatball, what is coming down the pike in the land of the pit in the coming week? You know, uh, we are doing our directional trading primer on uh, December 5th. You can go to optionpit.com slash DIR primer, and it's 147 bucks. Uh, use the Option Insider Radio coupon code 25 underscore OFF, off all in caps, and you take an extra 25 bucks off. So a uh, little deal for all of all of you people. It's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of volatility, a lot of discussion. So uh, looking forward to that on the 5th. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing all about Russell's uh, experiences in, uh, in the uh, Asian Risk Management Conference. That's going to be a lot of fun to listen to. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't make that one. Not in the travel budget this year, but I'm looking forward to hearing all about it. And you heard it from Mr. Greasy Meatball, 25 underscore off, all in caps. Surf on over to optionpit.com and enter that in for a nice discount there on all of his fun webinars and volatility content. Check it out. I think you're going to like it. On behalf of the Greasy Meatball and Russell, who is yet 
to be nicknamed, and indeed myself. Even though Dr. Vix, I, I maybe see that. I don't know. We'll have to see. We'll, we'll have to get into it. <laughs> we'll send in your suggestions. We'd love to hear more from them. And of course, myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show. And of course, for sending in such great questions. We'll see you next time right here on Volatility Views. Thank you for listening to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. For episode archives and detailed show notes, please visit theoptionsinsider.com slash volatility views. Be sure to make your own voice heard by leaving a volatility voicemail at 773-669-4VOL or by posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider. Volatility Views is brought to you by Russell Investments, a global asset manager and one of only a few firms that offer actively managed multi-asset portfolios and services that include advice, investments, and implementation. For more information on Russell indexes and RVX, please visit russell.com slash indexes. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.